Like me, Peter was born in Wellington uh, and moved to the UK and the US and ended up working in the financial sector. Um, more recently, we got involved in high-level management of Lindbergh Station. He moved there in 2012 and commenced a regenerative agriculture journey. He combines his agriculture entrepreneurial backgrounds with his love of farming to turn the station into a success. So, um, Peter, please give me welcome. on how I'd start this off, but maybe I'll just start with um, how I felt when I was coming out here today. I, I went to Lincoln in 1989, I think I was living in Hudson Hall. It's probably the first time I've come, come back here since I, since I was studying here. Uh, it took me five years to do a three year degree. <laughs> I did, um, I studied urban valuation. I did that. And I didn't really go to university, I went surfing in Kaikoura, Dunedin, the West Coast. And then when the exams came, I'd get someone's notes and study them for about three days and stress and then study the exam. And obviously, if it took me five years, it was failure more than, more than passing. But it was actually probably one of the best lessons I ever had, I think, in, in my life because it made you have to work under pressure to be able to get things done. And uh, I just thought I'd tell that story because it's actually, I'm freaking out that I'm actually here at Lincoln talking to some people and lecture there did when I didn't really even sit in the lecture there. <laughs> uh, before, before I start, I'm just wondering, uh, could, I just, could I just have a show of hands of uh, people that have actually sown cover crops? Okay, so that may be 25% of you. Okay, that makes me feel that there is something that some of you people can learn. I, I didn't, didn't want to be talking to people and telling you things you probably already know, not that I know everything. What I'm going to talk about today is the learnings I have and what I believe, and I'm not saying they're, they're gospel, but they are things that I've actually touched on and, and seen and think they are worth conveying. Uh, just another quick thing, show of hands for arable farmers, sheep and beef, lifestyle, Dairy. Okay, great. So it uh, gives me a bit of background on everything. Okay, what, what I'm showing you here is just one of the cover crops that I planted recently on, my, on uh, Lindbergh Station. Uh, we had a field trip yesterday, we showed a couple of people this sort of thing. I was at a course the other day where, you know, we were talking Regenerate 2020 and there's a lot of discussion around you know, what you need to do before you plant anything. I've got a couple of questions. What, what do you think I did before I planted that, that crop? What's that? Grazed it. Grazed it. What else? Pardon? Watered it. Watered it. No, before I even planted it, decide what I was going to do. What would I do? Do you think I did a soil test? Yeah. Do you think I did a herbage test of what was there? Yeah. Yeah. Sprayed it out. What else would I have done? So, you, you know, you, some people in the course we're on, everyone's talking about soil tests, everyone's talking about plant tests, everyone's talking about soil and food web tests, getting all the data. With, with that, that paddock there, all we did is I went into the paddock, looked at the weeds, and then put a, a shovel in the ground, came up with a mix. We did, like I'm not organic, and so I did spray it with a litre of glyphosate with folic acid and a bit of fish, and then I just put it in the ground and walked away. What, why I'm telling you that story is, doing this, if we don't have to overcomplicate it. The weeds tell us what's going on. And, and that's what I've learned in my farming operation when I'm, when I'm um, doing what I do. And what I'm really here to do today to do is to talk about don't overthink it. And really, like, if I've, there's been a bit of an intro on who I am. I'm obviously not a farmer originally. I've done, I studied urban valuation. I went off and worked in uh, construction to start with. Went to London and New York working in derivatives, building systems, technology. Crazy change. Came back here. Started campaign companies, mobile marketing companies in New Zealand, Australia, and America. 
and uh, then I came back to New, uh, to New Zealand and went and lived on a family farm that uh, is called Limburn Station. Subsequently, I've started a company uh, called Symbiosis, which is actually selling cover crop seed. Where I'm based, this is where I'm based. I'm based between Monica and Dunedin. That's the farm. We're about 9,300 hectares. By that photo, what, what can you tell from that photo? We don't get much rain. Okay. So yesterday, we, we were there. We, we, some years we had 170 mils. Some years we get 400 mils. This year we're closer to 400 mils. Uh, but inherently, it gets very dry. And I think people were there yesterday, they certainly saw that. Why do we do what we do? We're, we're all about soil health. Uh, and I'll talk about the stories on why that happened shortly. Uh, we believe in diversity of cover crops, no-till, high-intensity grazing instead of synthetic fertiliser inputs, essentially. And we're really trying to just get resilience. We're trying to be able to keep something green in the ground all the time. So obviously, we have something photosynthesizing and feeding liquid carbon to the biology in the ground to keep them functioning. Because when you are out here and you have animals, it's obviously not high density stocking typically. The way in which we've farmed in the past is set stocking, putting things out there, it's sleepy, there's not, there's not too much active soil biology. This is what it's like in winter, and again, summer. Okay. What, if, what have I learned from using cover crops? Okay, the first thing I've really learned, I've learned, learned first and foremost about farming, I, can, I should say before I even get any further. You know, in 2007, I didn't know anything about farming at all. Going, living on the farm in 2012, I didn't even know what a drill was. Okay, I didn't really understand it. And so it's been a never ending learning curve for me. And one of the, the big learning curve moments for me was in, uh, would have been about 2013. We're sitting down there, I've been learning about cultivations, fertilizer, and everything. We're sitting there with a fertilizer rep, and uh, we planted ryegrass and clover in a certain area and put, uh, I think it was 200 kgs of crop master 20 in the ground, because that was what we were told to do, and nothing grew. And then we're sitting there with this fertilizer person again, and they're saying, you know, we're saying, well, it didn't work, what do we do? They say, put that in again. And I'm going, okay, now I really feel like I'm being sold something. And so I'll talk about where that ended up, but on the journey, really, where I got to is I got to a position where I learned about these principles. And a lot of you may be aware of them limited disturbance of soil. And from an organic perspective, when it's terminating, it may be, may be not so simple, but that's one thing we do during no till. Keeping armour, and that was what Walter was talking about, keeping protection to be able to make sure we keep moisture in the ground, and, and obviously keep liquid carbon basically going in through photosynthesizing plants functioning. Uh, diversity of plant species and animals. So one of the key things I, I, I focused on is diversity, living roots, and integrating animals. In 2014, when I was embarked on this journey, I picked up the phone and I spoke to Gabe Brown, and he said to me, don't do any soil tests, just plant seed. So for the last, you know, until 2019 or 18, that's all I did. I didn't really focus on anything else. I just, just got seed, made mixes, and had heaps of failures, and then I started to have successes at the same time. And one of the big learnings I'll talk about as we go through that is patience. This was what we were like. We were a farm that my grandfather died in 1986. We had managers on a farm. My, my father's a dentist, he lives in uh, Wellington. It was my mother who was brought up there. She managed it from afar. So we had managers farming the property and just doing a great job of stock or what they could, but we thought we were farming well if we weren't spending money. So there was no pasture renewal. This is Horatio Dry, that's what it's like all year before we started on our journey. Nothing grew. And so one of my key messages that everyone, everyone's going, I need to get crops up here, I need to get yield. It's not about the yield, it's about moving the needle. And when I say moving the needle, it's about changing that to that. And that, that's as simple as 
we're doing 800 to 1,000 hectares a year in very, very dry country where I have soil in places that's less than a, an inch deep. We farm rock, essentially, okay? And one of the key learnings for me is un it was the understanding that plants have symbiotic relationships. They're smart. They work together. So when you, my, my biggest limitation is water. That was the thing I learned. It wasn't fertility, it wasn't anything else. Straight up water. So I had to be able to, instead of spending money on fertility and trying to send money to town, I had to spend money on nature and, and trusting in seeds to grow. And so in dry environments, this is what is possible. It brings life to your property. So what I learned is when people said you can't do it, then I did it. That was my approach. I'm going to go and do it because what I was being told after learning the fertilizer thing was what people were telling me they didn't really know. So I, my approach was challenge what is possible and they say you can't do it, do it. And I've also, and my, my learnings also in business were, you know, when, when you have a business and you have a caravan company, what you're trying to do is have a differing proposition. You have trying to have a, a why. Why are we doing this? And actually trying to be different than everyone. Then I came to farming and everyone was trying to be the same. Everyone was trying to be exactly like their neighbour. And if they're not, they were worried about it. And so what I said there is, you know, you've got to think differently and for yourself. So do things your gut tells you, not, not what you're supposed to be doing in a, in a pre-organised order. In 2014, I had a, uh, an agronomist from Argentina turn up. Uh, we, we did, we've had a lot of woofers that come through. We've, I think we've probably had four or 500 people through now. Uh, we used to have 10 at a time. We'd be doing all sorts of jobs and just running them around the town. But there was a guy, the Argentinians are just passionate. They turn up, they want to learn, they want to do. And this guy had been just done a degree, and I had um, the gentleman that does VSAs, and his name avoids me right now, he's up in Palmerston. He came down and he showed us what we needed to do. So I trained him what we, what, what we needed to do, and this is an area of our farm. And we went and analyzed everything, and I found out we didn't have earthworms, and that was a little concerning. Did VSAs, documented everything, put them in a shared drive, can't sell it being back to them yet, but I've got that data. This is, this is that same area where I've been told to put ryegrass and clover. Okay, when I put diversity of cover crop, no fertiliser, and all of a sudden I get this to grow. So, scratching your head. In that area, some areas that had it have base saturation of 30 with salt. Okay, we have perfect soil through to very poor soil. The farm is 25 kilometres long. Okay, what I also then learn is I've got to do this. I've got to keep armour on the soil residue to feed the biology underneath. So I'm creating an environment below that actually feeds, feeds the biology. And then this is what I learned turned up. Life turned up. And then I learned that I've got to let go of control. So essentially what I've got to do is I've just got to put seeds in the ground and walk away. Let go, let things go to seed. People are always telling me I have to farm in, a, in you know, so many covers. Well, if we've got something to grow that high in the dry, we're doing well anyway. Okay? Let alone trying to you know, farm in that under irrigation, having to put water on them all the time. So we just let the chaos come, let things go to seed. I'm not an arable farm, I don't care if it reseeds. And then not stress, like I said, if they go to seed and embrace chaos. Putting animals in there and just seeing them do the thing. And you get your own little microclimate when this happens. When you get cover up here, all of a sudden, in that zone, it's like being in a glass house. It's humidity, you can pick the soil up with your hand. It really changes your perspective on it. You can stand next to animals and watch them select what they want to eat. The other thing I, I learned here is to understand that you'll make mistakes. And, or what you initially think are mistakes. So what I'm saying here, and I was, the point I was trying to get, we had a field trip yesterday and we're taking people around and people are talking to me, oh, did you get the fertility right before you went in there? I'm going, well, if I put the plants in there, nature's going to pick up what needs to grow and it's going to be okay. And so I learned through this whole process and I still challenge it, 
you know, you put stuff in and people think in 100 days you've got the books, it's got to be at, you know, so high and, and what have you. What I learned is that it's not 30 to 90 days, it's not 60 days, it's not a year, it's years. It's patience. It's actually grazing management with patience. If you put the right species in there, they will come. But if you're thinking you're going to plant something and eat it in 40 days, for me that was my learning. It is so wrong. And so in these paddocks when we're going through yesterday, we started off in some of our dry country going through loose and like that. And then we went and looked at covers that had things that were a bit sporadic. And I was saying to people, well that stuff that's like that, that was like that as well. But if you're patient and you manage it correctly, it will come. And it's just about water. Okay, Re regeneration, I've said it here, and the body. Living roots in the ground are the best cultivators. Okay, so what, what I'm doing here is you're using sorghum, you're using sunflowers, lucerne, radish, chicory, all sorts of things, different tapestries of roots to be able to get into and open up your soil, soil profile. What I'm also doing is understanding that mulch, so I use a crimping roller in places where we're laying things flat or animals to be able to leave root lasting roots due to build soil life and soil. Cycling the nutrients, so we're throwing animals and this sort of stuff and flattening it like I showed you to be able to then regenerate. And this is what they smash it into the ground and then it allows it to do its thing. Residue protects and, and generates faster recoveries. This is, we had, uh, this is a guy from Australia, Nuffield Scholar, they came out and they had a look at what we're doing here. This is a pass where we're putting stuff on, on laying flat just with a crimp and roll and drawing into it. And as soon as we're doing that, yesterday when you're doing, you pick up that there and you've got slugs and worms and everything just living on top of the ground, not even in the soil, under this mulch. So for me, it's just showing me that I'm actually moving things in the right direction and gives me confidence. Through the whole thing, people are saying to me, have you got it tested? Have you got the science? Have you got this? And I'm going, what do I need science for when I look at it and I see life? I see birds, I see, I see worms, I see bees. What, what do I need? And, and I see things growing. I see I have cover everywhere. What, why do I need to substantiate it with science? You know, what, what I've learned is to awaken the ability to observe, listen, smell, trust the good will outcompete the bad. So, you know, that, that's the biggest thing is trust your eyes. That's what I've learned is just trust what you think. We've lost the ability, the, the senses, you, you, you know, animals are, are, you see animals and how they act when they go and they know what to eat to self-medicate. We don't have that, those senses activated anymore. And that's what I see. And so it's awakening things, I'm seeing stuff and coming back, you know, and, and challenging the science sort of things. We've learned to leave to protect the covers and create the own microclimate, I've told you about that. And I've learned the diversity of plants equals less dependency on inputs. So it saved me money. What I, what I learned with this whole process is to do it the way I've done it, well, can be with conventional approaches, I think it's about 33% of the cost. So I've gone from doing, you know, at one stage when we were doing 250 hectares to 1,000 hectares for the same money. So it, it just takes stress out of it as well. People also, the one thing they say, a regenerative is less stressful. Well, I haven't completely got to that position. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really baffling with that one. I'm, I'm aiming there, but it does take the stress out of it. You're not going back trying to, okay, I've got this weed, what, why is that there? You know, and what have I got to do to get rid of it? It's actually about trusting nature to do it. And so, what it's allowed us to do in our environment is we've got life back and embracing it. I've got quail around the house. I've got turkeys running around that are fat and healthy. I've got deer everywhere. I've got bees, it's crazy. I've put horizontal hives in everywhere. People are going to me, are you going to get the honey? I'm going, I don't care about the honey. I want things that pollinate. I put them out in the middle of nowhere. So this is how we terminate a drill, or we try to. And this in your environment, I think vetch and rifle or cereal rye are golden in, a, in an organic environment. You can establish them in a, in a, in a uh, perennial pasture if you graze it correctly. And then what you can then do is crimp and drill behind it. This is how we're doing, learning to cultivate. Um, you, you don't need to cultivate to, to grow cover crops.
And I've learned to embrace weeds because they, you know, that book, uh, When Weeds Talk, that's a book that I really, really just made me realise why, why, why I have certain things happening. And so the, my farm manager, he, he's always says, you know, thistles, I love thistles because they're actually cultivated. So it actually brings a new dynamic to things. I've got staff going down the road when they see those lucerns that are clean and everything going, well, that's boring because it's chemical. It's actually not trying to fix it. You guys, are, I'm preaching to the choir, I know, but this is just my journey. And I've learned to, to, that diverse mixtures allow these things here, cyclone nitrogen, soil profile to open up, life in the soil, protection of the soil, erosion control, grazing for livestock, soil building, subsoiling, obtaining phosphorus from potassium with buckwheat. Here we are doing an infiltration test. And this is just what it's allowed on my property is the staff to actually come alive. And actually they're touching, they're seeing it now, and they're really engaging with it. And also diversity means green solar panels are resilient and pumped up with carbon into sleepy soil. Out here, very fungally dominated. So getting stuff out here and activating it and hitting it with large mobs of stock. So now what we're doing is we're running mobs of up to 4,000 news through these paddocks and we're shift doing daily shifts. So the staff are engaging there, they love it because what they're then doing is they're using their dogs all the time on big mobs. So shift, shift, shift. And, and it's, it's really, and, and so Hamish will talk to you more about that, but from our side of things, we're making it work for our environment. We're doing it on small paddocks as well. What I also did is I put everything into matrices to understand what, what plants do what. So I've got buck wheat and things like that, and I'll talk about that. This is what we do. We mix all our seed ourselves in coffee mixes. Bring it all in, and we're doing the same thing as shipping it out and selling it to symbiosis. Getting these sort of things, and people say to me, hey, can you put all that seed in one bin? And I say, yeah, no problem. You don't have to separate the small and the big, you just stick them in the ground and make sure they're not too deep, and it grows. People go, oh, yeah, but then birds get it. Yeah, well, so what? something grows, just trust in it. It's all about an ecosystem. I have strategies on how I do it. Obviously, I use a little bit of glyphosate sometimes, but sometimes we eat it to the boards and then drill. Sometimes we're drilling now and they're dry. We're using the timings of nature when things aren't prevalent and we're putting stuff in where if not everything is flourishing and, and getting other seed in. We're also crimp rolling and doing these sort of things, and I do setups where I do annual covers, annual covers, and annual covers, and perennials. And I've done all these three different versions on how I get stuff in. So more and more I'm trusting to be able to put, put stuff into existing pasture. This is, this is a result after I've had annuals and perennials. I had stuff this high, gets eaten, and I'd, I'd sign it with you know, grasses and lucerne, and, and clover and this is what comes back. You know, people will often ask me what, what covers work on their, your farm and I, I just say everything will. Just you just gotta put pinches of everything in the ground and then nature will define what grows. So when it comes to different different products, you know, you can see here sorghum that's got big tap roots underneath and it's a subsoil and I'm not gonna go through them all. You know, sunflowers doing the same sort of thing, dealing with surface compaction. Um, and scavenging nitrogen and what have you. Yellow mustard, beneficial organisms, bringing bees. Black oats, scavenging nitrogen, you can obviously eat it. It's got allopathic effects. <coughs> Peas, the same sort of thing with nitrogen. Lentils, again, they're all got different sorts of tap roots as well. Or, or root structures, so you can see what works and what doesn't. Linseed, building soil. So I've got a lot of these things. You put them out there and, and different things grow and then they go to seed and then it regenerates and a lot of this stuff. Rye corn through using animals. This is, to me, I think it's the wonder plant. But really in my environment, this creates huge cover. Gets up and goes to seed in November, uh, December, and then I can do different things with it. Beans again for nitrogen and, and surface compaction and just being able to eat. So if you, if I wasn't talking to you guys, I'd be saying, 
you know, subsequently, you know, you substitute your rear with all these sort of plants. Uh, yesterday we had all these dairy farmers at a, at a property, Harbour University is my neighbour, okay? They're, they're there, they just fertiliser always going out, fodder beef, what have you. They need to start thinking about how they can bring this in and actually decrease their costs. Vets in my environment again are one to plant. It grows in the cold, it's fantastic. When I've got it with ripon, it's massive. This year we've got it both up here, very high. The ripon, uh, the vets got so heavy it made the ripon lay down before we flattened it with a crimping roller. Buckwheat, rendering phosphorus and potassium, another C4 plant like sorghum. Then crimson clover. What it can do, I put this in a lot of the setup mixes. So, one thing I should explain when I'm doing annuals, I call them setup mixes. It's actually about just putting annuals, lots of lots of annuals and things with pinches of everything, and getting them to grow and actually open up your soil profile, get get nutrients cycling, and then ultimately after one or two years, I start to introduce perennials. And this is what I use in there. Strawberry clo strawberry clover is another one I use in the lucerne, which is a perennial. Radish, you can see what that does. It is a tillage radish, opens up the soil profile, becomes a nitrogen sink for the next plant. And the cedar, obviously attracting these guys, very beneficial. And this is the other thing we do, and I'm sure you guys are all in this space, where you see water, seaweed, and have a mixing bin, and then Steve Erickson here with us here was really giving this a workout, I tell you. It's a great machine, it's simple to use, and it actually gets out in our environment. We can go through the hills and anyone can drive it. So we just put come out with mixes and sticking them out there. And here's the other thing we're doing. We've moved and we've got mineral feeders, we've thrown them out and about and giving it a go. So that's me. Has anyone got any questions? Peter, do you um, do you ever crimp after you've grazed? Like when you have that sort of the dry matter left on top, you know, you've got a lot of cover there. Um, then do you take, um, have you ever tried crimping on that material to bring it down closer to the ground for digestion? Yeah, we've, we've, we've started using the crimping all of this by itself in places. Uh, after, after we've grazed uh, in environments where we, we're trying to, um, you know, like instead of Topping California, some of California thistles were very prevalent in places. We just crimp all that sometimes as well. So we, we use it in many situations. You're obviously using a lot of seed. Um, what, who grows your seed? Like, where do you get it all from? Uh, there's growers in the here that we get seed from. Seed, seed is like growers, a lot of growers grow seed to provide under contract to other people who then take it and then they sell it on to someone else and they sell it on to someone else. It's a pyramid scheme is what I term it. And, and it's like, we, we sometimes you've got to buy at the top of the pyramid, sometimes you've got to buy at the, the bottom of the pyramid. And it comes down to supply and demand like any market. And really what we're trying to do is be able to make sure that we can make sure the grower, when we're ever doing anything, gets paid fairly. Okay, what we see is all of a sudden the big, you know, people that have taken a lot, you know, monopoly sort of approach and trying to control the oil industry, we really want to be able to make you know, it's fair for everyone, so you haven't got margin on margin on margin on margin. And so when, from a seed business, what we do is we acquire stuff, it's, we're, we're passing that cost on, and then just the mixing cost, and, a, and like a 15% margin. So, so we're trying to... Exactly, just have Monsanto make the whole margin. Exactly. Yeah. It, you know, so it, it, it's... Yeah, it's, 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 things are changing, I guess you could say, but getting as many growers, as many places, and yeah, it's, it's like... Many farmers are producing. Yep. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> you say you, you drill everything, and have you tried uh, um, over sowing and drilling? Yeah, we we this year we did about 150 hectares just out of the helicopter because uh, we've got a lot of ground where we, we can't get everything to go, and so you're just mindful of, of when you're doing that. It, it's we, we get, get things to grow, but it's not as successful as drilling. We also, out of the chaos spring, we throw it in there, drive through pastures, and we're putting clovers in and putting them out as well.
advice from the cool season cover crop. Should we be putting in everything and all the warm season seeds also all in this one go and then just letting it come up when it com comes up? Or I think it's time timing's a factor. You know, if, as long as you understand, like you put buckwheat in now, as soon as it gets frosted, it's gone. You know, sunflower as well. As soon as you so it comes down to when you think you're going to get these frosts. Because if you can get something to get up to, you know, even that height, it's doing a job. If you listen to Christine Jones talk about when plants drive the most carbon into the ground, it's actually when they're germinating to that sort of height, not not this sort of height. So it's kind of interesting, you know. So I think everything has a benefit. It kind of comes down to cost. You know, if you've got something that's very expensive, I wouldn't do it. But if it's cheap and it's going to do you something in, you know, in a short term, then you know, by all means do it. Uh, what um, factors do you take into account when you consider uh, when you bring the stock on, and what's your um, average round length? So if I just understand that correctly, when, when do we bring stock on? To graze those paddocks. Uh, we don't, one of the things yesterday we were talking about people going, when are you going to graze that? And we, we said to people, oh, we don't know. Okay, we, we're, what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to get cover, and so sometimes things will go to seed, like we haven't got there yet, where we've never got to a paddock and grazed it, but that would be quite cool. Because what we're really trying to do in our property is actually get to a position where we don't have to feed silage. We're trying to get cover everywhere so we can actually just rotate big mobs around paddocks all the time. To, but, but really, if you're an arable farmer and you've got a three month window and you've got to eat that before you go into your next cash crop, then you could be in there in a short term. Sometimes, like we're planting in, let's say, October, November, and we're not eating till July or even or even August. So, so in a dairy farm situation, yep. what um, suggestions have you got? In a dairy farm situation, it depends on how much area you've got, how much area you're looking to put into cover crop. But if you're doing, let's say, 10% and trying to get stuff up, you really want to give it three, four, five months to be able to get to a good height where you get a good cover, you come in and smash it, leave the residue, and move on, and, and if you've got your mix right and, and you want to be able to get stuff to regrow at certain times, you can use that as well. But it comes down to so many different factors on what you're trying to achieve, when you're trying to go into perennials, state of the soil, etc. So in a 12 month period, how often do you think the dairy herd would go into one of these paddocks? How often will we go into them? Uh, for us, it can be like if we've got something that's going to regrow, we can go in, you know, if we planted something in, let's say, the beginning of November, and we went in, in April, we would, let's say, they're, they're in there, they clean, clean that up, then it may grow again before April, you could potentially graze it just going into the winter, coming, then coming out of the spring, you let it get away, and then you go in and graze it again, it grows again, and then, uh, and then you can graze it again, then you can let it go to get to the seed, and then you can crimp it. So it depends on what you've got in your mix. If you've got mixes, if you've got uh, annuals that don't regrow, then you're not going to be able to do what I told you. But it comes down to understanding if you have got, you've got annuals that do regrow that you can graze more than once. Find you get pretty good reseeding and persistence once the cover crop has been in for a few years, or are you constantly having to go back and add a bit all the time? What, what we're finding there, it depends on management, on what, what you do if you let things get to seed, but where, where, where we're going is we go annual, let's say, in, in an example where you follow what Dave Brown sometimes recommends, he says go on annual, then another annual, then, then annuals and perennials. Well, when, when you're in the perennial stage, you're not having to come back there. Okay, I haven't got to a position where I'm coming back unless it was a disaster, okay? And that has happened, but nine times, even more than nine, 95% of the time, you're not having to do that, okay? But, but really, you, you know, if you're putting diversity in there and you're managing it correctly, things are gonna grow. You just gotta be patient and, and let let it all go and, and, and then you gotta let it go to see at times as well to regenerate. Yep. Have you thought of using shrubs and trees as part of the ecosystem yet or a absolutely like silver pasture, silver culture, whatever you term it, I'm not sure, but 
what, what we've done is we've planted probably 10,000 trees in our environment. We, we probably end up with about a 50% 50, 50 success rate on survivability. And so all around all our irrigated areas, we, we're trying to put shelter in. We've used lots of different trees in our environment, poplars, willows, suppressus, um, uh, the Australian, I can't remember if it's just the main blank, not the main blank, but no, we're, we're right in that space and just off the back of what was being said before and generating more, more rain, I think that's going to be a focus, especially around the, the rest of the farm. So we might have to have drip irrigation that we're putting into other places to keep these things going. Anything else? And, and just, just to comment a bit more on that, one of the things that we're learning that I'm having is that trees, trees take up nutrients and then share them back. That's my understanding. So then you're finding pasture that are near trees are actually flourishing in times of hardship. Um, do you think there's any benefit of putting bio stimulants and stuff in with the seed? I think there definitely is, but we have not gone there. Like uh, in anger anyway, like um, the guy Grant Sims who farms in Victoria, who's got liquid liquid stuff where he's going in and he's having great success with, with it. Uh, we we sometimes put, when we put biosimmons in, we, we have put humate prills in with a little bit of lime at times. We've also put, we were given mycorrhizal fungi by I uh, can't remember, we've given 2,000 2, kilos this year with pumice, with mycorrhizal fungi. We've put that in as well, experimenting with different things. And we sometimes uh, sprinkle trichoderma on our seed as well. But we, we're not advocating for that all the time. We're using trichoderma in the cow spring sprayer, all sorts of different little things. And so only with the biosimulants from the sprayer have we really had that in the last 18 months. Thanks for the presentation. I see on the farm map there was some centre pivots. What would you tend to put in under that more intensive part of your farm? And then a comment on mine, which you started to say then, okay. but yeah, particularly on that part of the farm. Okay, centre pivots, we have about 500 hectares under irrigation, and where we are moving to is it's just exactly what we're doing in the dry land. So that's lucerne, we're diverse, so we, we've got lucerne's that are dormancy of two, Okay, and, and branching, and typically with those, they are better suited to companion planting or diversity. And then we've got, you know, coxford, broom, fescue, uh, a little bit of ryegrass, lots of different clovers, phalaris, every timothy, every pinches of every sort of grass we can possibly get in there and not too much. But the one thing I do say is that ryegrass and white clover and red clover are not my friend. I don't use them in anger at all. I really move away from them. I'll be using, you know, Caucasian clover, arrow leaf clover, or, um, strawberry clover, um, just lots of other different things. And I'll put uh, sheep's and egg chicory, you know, little pinches of all the different herbs I can find. Uh, this year we've gone and, you know, using cornflower and lots of other beneficial flowers and some of our mixes to bring bees and everything into our environment as well. So to answer that, the number one thing I'm using is lucerne everywhere in my environment because that means under irrigation, if I can get it to even get up here, then it provides protection. Uh, I don't need to water as much, and then, it, then when I've got protection, then it's got the shelter from the sun, because we get you know, 40 knots sort of nor'westers that dry everything out very quickly. We can get 40 degree heat. So uh, you know, that sort of stuff can shelter. How do, how do you deal with the more noxious weeds? You must have some. I, I, we, we, like, we have mallow, we have horatium, and hoarhound are probably our worst weeds. And when I say worst, you know, I used to, at one stage, really be focused on trying to get rid of hoarhound because it gets in the wall. We, we farm half-breed sheep, so if it gets in the wall, then vegetable matter, then it, it decreases. Um, and barley grass would probably be another one. But where we, we've got to is we just forget about them. We don't care. We're trying to change the underlying environment to be able to get rid of them. Um, and, you know, mallow, one of the things is obviously it's got huge tap roots and everything under there as well. Stop eating them. Um, and so we, weeds are, like I said, they're telling you something. And, it, like, if you came and saw what we're doing yesterday, if I was trying to get rid of weeds, I'd be broke very, very quickly. Okay, they are growing, and if they grow in my dry country and actually give me cover, they're my friend. To what extent are uh, other farmers in the Central Otago 
um, region adopting regenerative grazing practices? I think for five or six years ago when I started this, I didn't talk to anyone about what I was doing, uh, especially in my area. My area is very old school, and you know, so you were seen not, not in a great light. And then I think in the last two and a half years, that's changed. Now you can talk to people, and all of a sudden, we had yesterday, we had a field day, we had 140 people there, and all my neighbours are there. All the all of they were. I was expecting them to come and then leave after lunch, but they were there to the end of the day. And the feedback I've got from them off the back of that is they're impressed, that they're engaged, and they're listening because in our environment, you've got water challenges, we've got environmental challenges that are coming, and people are waking up to it. My neighbour has bought seed off me, you know, so people are realising that you've got, to, you've got to look at alternatives. And so I think for all of us, it gives us hope, you know, it gives us hope that. Momentum is actually changing, and people are really trying to. I mean, no one's farming to, I believe, to try and make their land poorer. And so it's about education, changing what people have been taught, challenging it, and trying to make them see that there's other ways. Kia ora, thanks so much, Peter. Really inspiring. When it comes to the nuances of the different soil and climates around Aotearoa, are you trialing or looking to trial more deeply in other regions to distinguish? some of those most optimal seed mixes? Yeah, through, through what we've been doing when we're mixing seed, we're sending them to all parts of the North Island, West Coast, Canterbury, they're going everywhere and you get the photos back and you're seeing people, you know, what, what the mixes that I use work everywhere. If you've got pinches, it's kind of like people go to me, well, if I put them all in, they got some people come, oh, that seed, I didn't see that. I'm going, well, that's, what you expect, not everything is going to, going to seed. You've got, in your soil at any one time, you've got lots of different seeds anyway. And all you're trying to do is give pinches of different things. So if you've got compaction, you know, um, and you, how you're trying to address that, when you're using those plants I showed you at certain times of the year, radish, you know, sunflower, uh, sorghum, you know, chicory, whatever you're using to try and get roots down to break up pans. But that's the case, everyone's got pans and compaction all through the country. And so if you get that in there in pinches, then nature will define what will grow. So I think, you know, people, everything will grow at the right time. People say to me, you'll never grow soil from where I am. And I put, put it in, you just got to wait for the soil temperature to be 15 degrees. And if we get that, certainly at a time, and it gets very hot, and you get the right conditions, and then next thing you've got soil from that high. And that was in the salty area. You know, and that's when I was showing you that stuff, that's got soil and things like that going crazy. So I think everywhere it will work, but you've just not got to, you just got to go in with an, an expectation on that, not everything's going to go in. If you're only putting in little pinches, then you're okay anyway. Uh, one thing just on lime, I'm using lime, I'm just putting that in 20 kgs of, into the Chaos Spring Sprayer at times, or less than that, depending on what we're doing. And that's fine lime uh, that I'm getting from places like Nitrosol or what have you. And I'm putting that in with Humate into that sprayer and putting it out there. Because uh, you know a lot of the weeds I have on my property are because I'm, I'm deficient in calcium, even when I've got good base saturation of calcium in my soils, and that's because the mag is too high, so the ratio is too squeezed, and so you know, the compaction and I've got thistles as a result in places. But I'm going to another part of my country, and I've got completely different weeds. Congratulations! Thank you very much. Thanks,